Okay, so where we left off was a concept called tropism. Um, it's interesting you see different parts of uh, my life. Uh, that last video was recorded, uh, gosh, I want to say last February when I was in Washington, D.C. at an APA um, state leadership conference. And now I'm inviting you into my home. So, welcome. Um, so, where we left off is a concept of tropism. And we talked about how the environment can impact you in direct and indirect ways. But what about people creating their own environments? And that is really what uh, a tropism is. So tropism, by definition, is a tendency to seek particular environments. So in reality, not everything is outside of our own control. Many times people uh, establish environments that are better for them. Uh, the example your book gives is that extroverts might seek more uh, job changes and they might move around more and move from home to home more. Uh, even when we think about uh, the idea of like choosing uh, vacation sites, an extrovert might choose to be inside a, a wild, crazy party, whereas an introvert introvert might choose to spend that time on the beach, in the hotel, enjoying the quiet of nature. So um, tropism suggests that we choose to some degree our environment, right? And we talked about temperament, but uh, temperament is not separate or independent from your environment. Um, and another example of that is that people who are born blind, uh, they develop similar personality traits, which means the loss of vision uh, impacts how people relate to their world. So that environmental change alters how they see themselves. Okay. So now let's talk about Sheldon. Sheldon talks about somatotypes, and a somatotype is basically a body type. And the belief was that different body types were uh, linked to mental illness. Um, again, when we examine uh, theories, it's important to talk about whether they're correct or incorrect. Uh, this theory is uh, overly simplistic. Uh, it is, I will grant you that endomorphs, um, they tend to have greater rates of mental illness, but it might be due to some kind of metabolic problem. It might be due to some um, neurotransmitter-based problem, or there are many different reasons why, and, and it's not just the body type. Okay, so let's talk about body types. According to Sheldon, there are three major body types. There is a mesomorph. A mesomorph is a person who's muscular, large boned, athletic. Um, so meso being middle. So this is the middle body type. Uh, this is the body type that apparently we're supposed to be striving for. Uh, then we have the ectomorph, ecto being outer. Um, so they're very slender, bookworm type. So apparently if you're very skinny, you're a bookworm, whatever. And then endomorph, uh, this is a person who's overweight or, uh, described as roly poly. Uh, and these ind individuals are described as good natured. Now it's interesting that if you look in Hollywood, uh, they capitalize on this. Um, I guess, who was it? Melissa McCarthy is a good example of a person who was very overweight and they casted her for many roles where she would be like this jolly, like silly kind of person, but, you know, good natured. Um, I believe she's on a show that just recently got canceled. And the primary reason is that she lost a lot of weight, which is absurd, but uh, that's what happened. And then, um, what's his name? Gosh, uh, the, the, the male person, uh, similar boat. Um, I'm drawing a blank. I don't know. But um, 
he, gosh, oh, all right, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not going to remember it, so. Okay, so uh, the point is that endomorphs are seen as roly-poly, good-natured, and in fact, the holidays just passed, and it's interesting that we put Saint Nick, or, or Santa Claus, he's also a character of an endomorph, and he's viewed as like this jolly old fella, right? All right, so I'll leave that alone. Um, so how do we explain somatotypes, right? So it, to the extent that body type and personality uh, are linked in any way, one explanation is that uh, the physiological uh, cause could impact both person personality and body type. And an example of that would be a person who has a thyroid condition, right? So if you have a thyroid condition, um, particularly hypothyroidism, uh, it's possible that you might gain excessive amounts of weight. And it's also possible uh, that, and this is inconsistent with what uh, Sheldon said, but it is also possible that you can have greater rates of depression. So you see how uh, something physiological could alter both. Uh, the flip side, instead of looking inside of ourselves, we could look at social influences, right? So I talked to you about Hollywood and how Hollywood sort of casts people in certain roles based on their appearance. Um, and weight is such a, a thing. So social influences could be um, at play there. Uh, also, dramatic changes in one body could uh, change one's physiological responding patterns. So um, I know we talked about uh, neurochemistry and psychopharmacology and all of that, but the body is impacted by the, the way the neurons fire and the, and the neurochemicals or neurotransmitters uh, that are uh, being affected. That's a major deal. Um, so any shift in one's body could have an indirect effect on that as well. Also, uh, we perform in accordance with an expectancy effect. So we behave in accordance with the way people perceive us. So knowing that, um, a person is overweight and overweight people are viewed as jolly or whatever, um, they may play that role for you. Okay. Uh, what about the effect of the reaction uh, for, of others? So physical characteristics influence the way others treat us and therefore they mold our view of the world or our personalities. Um, and I, I have to tell you that we see ourselves heavily based on how we're treated. Uh, so the best example is that tall people, you look up to them, short people, you look down on them. And that isn't just uh, your neck moving up or your neck moving down. That really is that we tend to idealize a person who's taller. We tend to somehow give them positive attributes because they're tall. And people are short, we kind of dismiss um, it's not just looking down physically. So it's interesting, height plays a role in how we even perceive people. Um, physical appearance does not stop us or preclude us from activities, but it kind of alters expectations. So for example, if I were to want to go play basketball, I'm relatively short. I mean, the average person, average male is about 5'8". I'm 5'11", six foot on a good day. Um, but the average basketball player is about 6'6", 6'7". So if I get out on a basketball court, relatively speaking, um, the expectations would be lower. And in fact, uh, when we talk about someone like Steph Curry, Steph Curry is a short basketball player. And um, when he was playing at Davidson, uh, I don't think people saw him as the great talent that we see him today. And the expectations were lower. 
And then, and part of that, I do believe, is that uh, it was his appearance. He looks like a little kid. He looks very short. He looks like he doesn't belong on the court with the rest of the big guys. Um, but he's demonstrated that um, you can transcend that, too. Um, surgeries alter our personality, uh, do the way people treat us. The best example I can give you is, God forbid, a person is has an amputation. They wind up in a wheelchair. All of a sudden, you start to treat someone differently. Uh, and then people who are being treated differently, they start to feel differently about themselves. And it's one of the biggest struggle uh, with people who are amputees or um, have uh, paraplegia or whatnot is to maintain a sense of self, maintain a sense of independence or whatnot because of how they're treated. Uh, here's a fun one. Um, there's a concept called a halo effect in psychology. Now, there's positive halos and negative halos. I'm only going to talk about positive halos in this lecture. But what is a halo effect? A halo effect is that you see one desirable attribute of a person and then you apply it to other aspects of their life. Um, a negative halo would be where you see undesirable attribute and then you apply it to other aspects of their life. But a positive halo, one of the examples of a positive halo is something called the physical attractiveness stereotype. Um, people who are physically attractive, uh, you expect them to succeed in life, right? People who are physically attractive, they're viewed as happier people in life. People uh, who are physically attractive, it's not on the slide, but um, they're viewed as more intelligent. People who are physically attractive are viewed as friendlier than non-attractive people. And it, it's interesting that when I talk about competence, when I talk about uh, friendliness, when I talk about intelligence, the research indicates in general your physical attractiveness has nothing to do with any of these virtues. Uh, yet, when we look at people, we tend to perceive them that way. So being part of a desirable group, whether it's skin color, eye color, ethnic, um, ethnic color, whatever it may be, um, that comes with uh, benefits. And without getting too controversial, people hate when you talk about this concept called white privilege. Um, but it's real. It's real that um, people who are part of the white majority are provided advantages in society uh, from minority groups. And um, that's unfortunate. And I don't think that it's always a conscious thing, and I don't think it always stems from racism. But there is certainly white privilege. And I'm sure if you are... Uh, white and you're listening to this, um, you might be like, no, that's ridiculous. That's silly. Um, and I get that because you may be blind to it because it's, it's, um, it's sometimes you're not aware of what a minority group struggles with. But if you talk to people who are minorities, social psychologists have found this, uh, sociologists have, have found it, uh, in fact, there's a term called shopping while black, and this is an absurd term, um, but if you are African American and you go into a high-end retail store and um, you're looking around, you better believe that you're going to have a tail. What do I mean by that? You better believe that someone is going to follow you around the store because... Um, there is this uh, stereotype, oh, you're going to steal. Now, if you're white, you're not going to have people following you around the store. And you're not even going to notice, right? But unless you have uh, friends or family that experience this and they talk to you about it, you're going to be like, whatever. Everyone experiences the world the way I do. So there may be a blindness to white privilege. 
I understand that. Uh, but wait, um, there are affordances given and it's unfair. Another thing we talk about uh, when we talk about skin color is racial profiling. If you look at the Harvard Law Review, they analyzed NYPD and they found that NYPD racially profiles minorities. Now that, again, if you're Caucasian, you may not feel this experience because you're not the one being stopped. Um, it's interesting that how uh, certain aspects of our physical being uh, make us treated differently. And um, one of my passions is diversity and um, working to advocate for change for minorities. Um, and it started with advocating for religious minorities and whatnot, but uh, diversity in general is important. And if I don't talk to you about that, I feel like I'm losing an important moment in this class. So I will move on, but be mindful that being a minority uh, in this country uh, comes with more difficulties and being a majority culture comes with uh, affordances uh, and it's not an equal system always. Okay. Sociobiology. So what is sociobiology? This is the uh, study of the influence of evolutionary biology on social matters. So things like mating rituals, uh, defensive aggression, social organization. This is sociobiology. Um, if you look at it, uh, courtship uh, follows sociobiology. So there's this understanding that the way you posture uh, suggests certain things about your availability. The way you speak suggests things about your availability. Even uh, social scripts, which I'll talk to you about later, um, who approaches who, what do you say, all of these things are highly regulated. In the animal kingdom, it's, it's a lot easier to see, but it occurs in human beings as well. So uh, um, deers may lock antlers, and whoever uh, wins that uh, wrestle will have access to the female deer. Um, fish, they swim in a certain way to suggest they're interested. And I talked about human beings. Uh, we have ways to suggest we're interested, whether it's eye contact, whether it's fidgeting in a certain way, whether it's posturing. There are certain things that we do. Uh, aggression is another thing that's bound by sociobiology. Uh, aggression, we have uh, two types of aggression that we generally talk about, which is defensive aggression and predatory aggression. Um, Again, largely defensive aggression. If we're cornered, we're likely to lash out. Uh, how we raise our children is, raised, uh, is based on biology. So we're wired for a lot of different things based on biology. So it's, a, it's this, um, the biological impact on social matters. So to be aggressive, we're wired to be aggressive, largely to protect ourselves. Uh, courtship dating, uh, propagating our, our, our seed or having children, uh, we're wired for that. Uh, raising young or taking care of children, uh, there's not a manual for taking care of children, but most people figure it out because biologically we're wired for that. Uh, another thing that we're wired for in general is attachment. And attachment, I talked about intimacy as being a close emotional bond. Uh, and attachment's also a close emotional bond. So you're probably sitting there thinking like, well, what's the difference between attachment and intimacy? Well, attachment, we're looking at caregiver-child relationships. And intimacy, we're looking at romantic or friendship-based uh, relationships. So they're both close emotional bonds, but attachment is usually with a caregiver and they're young. And this is very, very important. Because without attachment, people will abandon their young. Um, in the animal kingdom, we talk about um, cats, right? If you, they say don't play with cats or, or whatnot, because if you play with a kitten, uh, you'll put a different scent on it, and then the, 
then the mother cat may not take care of it um, because it's no longer hers. Um, and that's the way it is with many animals, but the human beings um, are the same way. Attachment's essential so that uh, the caregiver is motivated to take care of the young. All right, so one of the things we talk about in sociobiology is that uh, biological children are treated preferentially to non-biological children. And in fact, we have a term for this, and this is called Cinderella effect. So stepchildren are, um, stepchildren are treated worse than children. So if you look in Cinderella, all of a sudden the stepmother comes in, she brings her two daughters, and then she treats Cinderella like crap. Um, how is it that Cinderella was treated that way? It's because that's not her child. So it's interesting when we talk about blended families, this is a big discussion that people have. I know I have had it. Um, and uh, the, the conversation is like, how do I know you're going to treat my kids the same way you treat your own? And that's an important one um, because there's a natural tendency based on sociobiology, a natural tendency to want to take care of your children, to want to take care of uh, the children you have um, more than other people's children. That's natural. And it's funny, I'll share a story with you. Uh, gosh, I think it was a couple of years ago, I was dating this, um, this woman and um, she doesn't have kids. Um, and I have two kids. And she, she asked me a question related to this. And she was like, how do I know that you will take care of our kids or maybe you'll treat your kids better. And immediately I was thinking like, I should be asking you that question because whatever kids we have together, they're gonna to be my kids too, biologically speaking. Whereas the kids that I bring in, my two children that I bring into the relationship, they're not biologically yours. So I, if anyone should have this concern, um, it should be me. In any event, uh, it did not work out, um, but that's okay. Uh, it, it wasn't, that wasn't the reason why it didn't work out, but I figured I'd share with you because uh, it's on people's radar that stepchildren are sometimes feeling like an outsider. Okay, now, um, where does this come from? This comes from natural selection. We're wired, like I said, to protect our young. Um, uh, it's kind of controversial. People don't like to hear this. People would like to believe that they're going to treat everyone the same, uh, but it's it's just not true. There is a natural tendency to show favoritism. Um, one of the 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 reasons why this theory is controversial is because it sheds light into that taboo. We don't want to hear that we treat kids differently. If I were to ask a parent, um, which child is your favorite child, uh, that's almost like I cursed at them. Uh, when in reality, if they dig deep enough, they probably might um, be able to identify one child is more. Uh, they enjoy interacting with one child over another. In my case, I play with my kids. I say, you're my favorite son and you're my favorite daughter. It's easy because I have one and one. But what if I had more? Ah, could be a problem. Okay. Um, now, a disclaimer. The Cinderella effect does not suggest that uh, if you're adopted or whatnot, that you cannot establish healthy bonds or relationships uh, with adoptive parents or step uh, parents. It's just... Uh, you know, it, it's a harder road, um, but you can. Uh, adoptive parents, step parents, if you're mindful, uh, you can establish these healthy, solid, strong attachments as if uh, the children were biologically yours. Okay. So, uh, biology, genetics can be used in adverse way. Um, uh, so let's talk about social Darwinism. Social Darwinism suggests 
that you have the right to dominate or kill others based on survival of the fittest. So if they were stronger, then uh, things would be better for them. If they were uh, more sophisticated, whatever it is. In fact, this is uh, one of the arguments of the Nazis because they felt that they were genetically superior. Therefore, they had the right to exterminate um, anyone who was considered inferior. And um, when I say there's something like 14, 15 million people killed in the Holocaust, that's a lot of people. Um, it wasn't just Jews. There was about 6 million Jews killed, but gypsies were killed. Uh, the mentally ill were killed, the elderly were killed, uh, the infirm were killed, people with intellectual disability were killed, uh, people who were part of the LGBT uh, community were killed because somehow they were considered inferior. So according to social Darwinism, let's kill them off, right? That's what the Nazis used. Uh, and that's a misuse of uh, the knowledge of genetics. Uh, but you're like, well, uh, the U.S. is um, better than the Nazis, right? No, we're not. We had this concept called eugenics. And eugenics um, is a mind-boggling mind thing that you had the right to sterilize the poor or sterilize people who um, had an intellectual disability. So if you look at the United States from state to state, there were sterilization laws uh, for the poor. Uh, and in this case, what I'm talking about is the intellectually disabled. Um, to the 1920s, 30s, a large portion of the country thought it was okay to sterilize people. Now, when I say intellectually disabled, uh, that's the new term for mental retardation in the DSM. So uh, sterilization, we're guilty of it. Uh, another thing we do, um, pardon me, I feel like I have to sneeze. <coughs> okay, another thing uh, we do, um, and it, this has been done a lot more the turn of the last century than now, is immigration law. In immigration law, uh, the mindset was to limit the population of undesirables and so we created massive legislation to limit the amount of Mexicans who came into the country. Um, in fact, that if you study um, why marijuana is treated as a Schedule One drug, it was actually to regulate immigration. Um, but people coming over from Europe, we put quotas on who could come over. Uh, and we pride ourselves on waves of immigration in this country. Uh, without getting too political, um, it's, it's come to be problematic again uh, because you hear uh, the president-elect, uh, Trump, talking about um, a ban of all Muslims, uh, which I hope that he will back off on, uh, or the idea of Syrian refugees uh, not letting them in. Uh, that's a problem because this country is based on opportunity. Um, I think he did actually sort of back off a little bit when he said that uh, serious vetting, that was his language. But um, yeah, you know, this is, this is a, a misuse of genetics. Okay, uh, I talked to you about the Nazis. Again, the Nazis... Uh, absolutely are the greatest example of this where um, they felt that they were the Aryan race was superior and therefore they started wiping all kinds of people out and Hitler I gave you the list uh, major groups were considered inferior and then uh, in the United States because I don't want us to be like oh those damn Nazis they're bad and us Americans we're good I, I think if you look at um, every country, every country um, has some problem with this or has in their history had some problem with this. Being homosexual a uh, hundred years ago, 50, even 50 years ago was an uncomfortable thing. 
being Asian, imagine being Japanese uh, post the bombing of um, uh, Pearl Harbor. That's a tough situation to be in, right? Uh, they, we had our own work camps or internment camps or imagine being a person of color, uh, African-American, um, uh, Latino, whatnot, um, pre-integration, pre-civil rights movement. Uh, it's it's not, not easy. Okay. Um, we do know that different cultures vary from one another. We do know that people are different. Cultures are different. However, this is the punchline. There is very little. Now, your slide says there's no evidence, but the, there's very little evidence that this is genetically based. So our individual differences largely are socially constructed. So to use genetics as a way of um, controlling, dominating, or killing off groups of people, all that is is genocide. That, that, that has nothing to do uh, or ethnic cleansing, perhaps. Um, that has nothing to do with uh, what the biology suggests. I hope that's important. I hope that's helpful to you. Okay, so let's finish up. Uh, a quick analogy, how does the biological approach see us uh, in terms of personality? We're a bundle of genes, brains, and hormones. Okay, um, advantages. One of the things that it does is it reveals uh, limitations that occur as a function of genetics uh, or bodily endowment and how that impacts personality. Because before we said this, we were thinking that oh, it's due to drives or motivations or, or the ego or whatnot. There are biological factors. They influence us. Uh, it also acknowledges uh, how biology impacts the reaction of others and the environments we choose. So biology shapes how other people react to us and how we choose a given environment. So that's a powerful statement. And one of the nicest things about the biological approach is that it's very easy to combine it with um, other approaches. So it's, this is one where you could easily say, well, this is what's going on underneath the surface, and this is what's going on in another way. So the biological approach uh, is one of the eight approaches that easily fits. What are some of the limitations? Um, so one of the problems, if we say that you're biologically wired to a, behave in a certain way, uh, it can limit or minimize our potential for growth. And you see that some of the models focus on growth and maturation or development. Uh, and the biological model would say, well, you're constrained by your genetics to some degree. Uh, that's a problem. Um, we talk about uh, the biological approach is very easily misused. If we were to talk about genetics and IQ, uh, there's a correlation of 0.7. People could run with that and say genetic um, IQ is genetically determined when all that means is that 49% is biology and 51 is environment. So a person could very easily oversimplify or go run with it or use it in a, in a way that it's not meant to be. Um, so in some cases, it could be strictly biological and it may not be appropriate for explaining psychological phenomenon. And... Um, biology has a hard time capturing consciousness. Okay, so these are some criticisms. Now, free will, um, no. Just like Freud, uh, you're limited, right? So Freud did not believe in uh, free will. He believed in psychical determinism. So according to biological approach, you also do not have free will. Bi behavior is determined by your genes or whatnot. So you're wired a certain way. Now assessment, the kind of assessment that we do is we do neuroscience, whether it's uh, brain scans or whatnot. We do uh, heritability studies, so this is twin studies or kinship studies. Um, we do physiological measures like um, blood pressure, heart rate, sweat conductance, etc. 
uh, these can tap into uh, part of who you are. Implications for therapy. All right. So here's where uh, the biological approach can have powerful impact. Um, we know that psychotropic medication can be useful uh, treating mental illness, right? Um, we know that sometimes people should be prescribed medicine. And I actually have a paper that I'm hoping will come out soon uh, entitled to prescribe or not to prescribe? That is the question. Um, and it, I break down medication into three types. Uh, one type of mental illness, uh, I would say you don't ever need to prescribe. Um, a second category is where prescribing is useful uh, as an adjunct as uh, you know an additional treatment and then there's a third category where prescribing is absolutely essential um, so th this is the way I break it down and I talk about um, in in the article things like eating disorders eating disorders you can treat largely without prescribing medication and then I talk about conduct or behavioral disturbances such as oppositional defiance or conduct disorder these can be treated without medication too, but if you give medication, it's helpful. Another example might be ADHD. And then when I talk about where medicine is strongly recommended, things like uh, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia. So, but the fact that we understand pharmacology the way we do uh, is great because we can use we can use various drugs to treat psychological conditions. Um, another thing is uh, PMS irritability. Now this is real. In fact, the DSM-5 uh, added a new disorder in a mood condition called premenstrual dysphoric disorder (PMDD). Uh, and so uh, I don't want you to think that everyone. Um, who has a menstrual cycle has PMS, right? It's 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 not as um, it's not as uh, pervasive as the movies would like to make it, or as exaggerated as perhaps uh, uh, male romantic partners or whatnot might make it out to be. But it is real. Something like uh, five percent of women uh, experience severe irritability in the advance of their period, and it goes on and on and on where they become uh, highly contentious, uh, their mood shifts markedly. And we know that we can treat uh, the, these symptoms simply with hormones. And it's interesting, the number one treatment for PMDD is birth control pills because it regulates uh, estrogen and progesterone levels. Isn't that fascinating? Um, and then obviously antihistamines or, or whatnot can uh, help uh, treat allergies or whatnot or, or toxins or whatnot. Okay, um, we're getting better at uh, gene therapy. Um, like I said, the Human Genome Project was able to identify uh, something like 25 to 30,000 distinct genes and we've been able to identify something like 7,000 genetic-based disorders. So we've come a long way. Um, as we do that, uh, gene therapies can help treat these conditions, but there can be some significant problems. For example, um, I don't know if you've heard the concept called a designer baby. And this is uh, if a person wants to get in vitro fertilization, they can select hair color, eye color, height, uh, average intelligence, whatever it is. And then at a certain point, what are we doing here? So there are some uh, potential moral problems with this as well. And that's the lecture. So I'm going to stop there. And I hope you enjoyed it.